since her early days, Crystal has published four collections of her poems, most recently Detroit as Barn, which has been a finalist for the National Poetry Series, Cleveland State Open Book Prize, and the Maine Book Award. She also has published books Troubled Tongues, Kin, and Lunatic. Her work has regularly appeared in the nation's leading journals and magazines and anthologies, and she's received a number of fellowships and honors for both her writing and her lead leadership. Uh, and I just wanted to share this quote about her latest book by David Mura in Detroit as Barn. Crystal Williams distills the breathing presences and absences in her native city. Its industrial decay and human resilience, its shouts of despair and whispers birthing love. Her poetry teaches us the words to the beauty that the world passes over, discovers a soul in what has been lost or cast aside. This book gives me hope for America and for American poetry, and hope too for the spirit of Detroit that lives within us all. And with that powerful quote, I would like to introduce to you Crystal Williams. Please give a warm welcome. <laughs> Good morning. I, um, I'm so thrilled to be here. I, readings in towns um, that I have never visited are always um, sort of magnificent to me because it reminds me of the life and breadth of poetry and how important the art form is, not just for those of us who live um, in the middle of urban environments, but also for those of us who live beyond, uh, <laughs> beyond, which is actually more people than not. So um, I thought I would read um, almost exclusively from Detroit as Barn today, although there are some new poems in, in this mix. Uh, and the reason for that is because last week I was in my hometown, uh, and uh, Detroit as Barn was written essentially in 2010 when the city was still quivering and very quiet, and there was a lot of national press about how horrible Detroit was, and that wasn't the Detroit I experienced both as a child nor and as an adult in 2010. Um, so I wanted to write a book, and but now the city is re-emerging, re um, uh, at least the, the places in the city that had been decimated are, are re-emerging. Places where I grew up had never been decimated, but that wasn't the story that you probably heard. So I thought in honor of my city, in honor of place, I would read poems about, about that great place. This is a poem called Detroit as Barn, which is the title poem for the book. Um, and it is dedicated to Phil Levine, who is a great Detroit poet. Detroit as Barn. Gone the hay, gone the tools, gone the morning work. Over there, a tractor rusts. Gone the cows, goats, the slack-tongued mule. Left are owls, rats, fat, wily cats, and the field where wild weeds grow. The farmer, they whisper driving past, knows everything a body needs to know about dying. You can tell by how he doesn't bother to paint or prop up the barn's worn wood. Still, Folks click their teeth and wonder on which day, at what time, the pitiful barn will give. The farmer, too, scratches his mighty balding head. But he's forgotten the good wood he used, the hard nails, the family, the friends and their strong backs, that long ago barn rising, that cider and fine punch. Some years ago, I was invited to participate in a, in a, a wonderful uh, project at the Museum of Modern Art in, um, in New York. Uh, Jacob Lawrence had created, the, the famous American artist Jacob Lawrence had created 60 panels about, um, about the American South, about the exodus of African American people from the American South. Uh, and we were asked to write poems in response to those panels. Uh, and our poems were included in the catalog of the exhibit at MoMA. This is the poem that I wrote in response to a panel called There Were Lynchings. And that panel is essentially a figure on a hill uh, under a tree at I think probably about this time of year because the figure had a, a blanket over 
and there were no leaves on the on the on the tree uh, limbs. Year after year, we visited Alabama. After Jacob Lawrence's, there were lynchings. The past has long legs and is heavy, which is a kind of warning. Stay clear of the enormous twisted tree on Tidwell Hill. To we cousins, the tree seemed fabulous, a grand old heron, wings stroking eternity, the southern vista beneath it so soft and innocent, so dramatically green. We were dazzled. From there, our lives unfurled hypnotically before us. We could be doctors and principals, actresses and mayors. We wanted to escape their watchfulness and murmurings, their relentless apprehensions that seemed to want to rein everything about us in. Our unruly hair, our clothes and brash voices and sauce, even our childlike curiosities. So we'd climb up, lay on Daisy's ancient red quilt, play word games, dream up novellas about a mutant bowl weevil called Bowl Winkle. Lament missing summers in Detroit with our friends. Truthfully, we thought they were too stubborn, too old school, overly full of moon gloss and doom. In our imagination, the past had no place among us, certainly didn't have heavy legs, wasn't resting on our shoulders, and wasn't hanging from a twisted tree. We also mistook their burgeoning pity for disapproval, the weight, the growing tightness in our shoulders as ephemeral and of only that place. So when I was writing this book, I, I was on sabbatical and so I took, um, oh, I took several months to, to stay in Detroit uh, among the many other places that I went on, on uh, during that year. And I had a dog named Oliver with me. He was a standard poodle, big guy, um, with a sort of puffy Afro puff on his head and a little puffy tail, very gentle beast. Um, and I would go down to the waterfront. There's a lovely river walk in, in the summertime. People with their children and visitors and residents of the city sort of make use of it. Uh, and so it's a, a, a wonderful parade of essentially joyfulness. And so I would go down almost every day with Oliver and he would lay out and I'd watch the people. And so this poem really emerged from that, from watching the reactions of people to the dog and how different the reactions were, which I thought probably had a lot to do with our history and race. At the Water for my dear friend A. Van Jordan uh, from Detroit's Riverwalk. Fifty feet in front of their mother, they lurch towards the dog sitting at your feet, an eruption of yeses, hands and arms like new branches twisting skyward. Their mother calls, don't touch that dog. And because they are good kids, smart, they heed and halt three feet from me as she makes her slow way towards us. All morning, I've watched some version of this birthing what parents give and cost their children. But history is nothing more than a chronic transfer of limitations, a way of understanding who we might have been. And who we are is bodies born of shackles, water. What these children do in the moment of desire, when the world offers beauty, is an anchor, a shackle, forcing them to yield and gawk at the dark tongue of no, at the foot of a tenacious history circling the edges, snapping its warnings, making their mother leery of even a dying toothless poodle. And so it's always the white children who claim the dog's body, their branchy limbs and excited eyes free of history's shadow. And Oliver is all possibility, patient and giving. Here, in the soft fur, in the yes, is where so much, perhaps everything, is lost. 
But then there are these two brown children still standing three feet shy of me, bodies tremorous, humming. Their mother, her eyes, the world's closed doors, moves past like a storm warning, sniffs, no, I said, come on. The girl is older. Already her hands have rubbed history's back. Her body turns towards the storm, but the boy's eyes move slowly, take in every bit of the dog's beautiful mountain, as if because he understands something about his mother and sister and self, he must savor, as if he will relent to the fact of his David and their Goliath, but he will not bow. His sister grabs his hand. Their mother's getting too far away. Maybe she is seven, he four. Uh, static for his pull, her tug. But outside of history reach, history's reach, he rallies, moves closer. His name is Oliver, I say. The boy considers me, looks down the river walk, says quietly to his mother's dark moving back, I want to say hi to Oliver. And I am broken with imaginings. The many corner stops, ways of knowing, cops, the time this black boy will be forced to call out his innocence intention to the world. And Lord, do I want him to be remaking himself before me, place marking this moment, deciding against the murky back of history, the keen tongued mother, the soft pull sister, deciding who he will become. It can be done, I think. But I say, hmm, Oliver knows you do, baby. And on another day, at another time, you two will be great friends. He considers me again. And then he leaves with such wide open eyes. Those black orbs, the young quiet hands, how he grew small and small sprinting towards the dark back of history, calling, here I come, here I come. <laughs> this poem also is in Detroit's barn and um, it's titled People Close to You. It's a amended contrapuntal. A contrapuntal is a poem that exists. It's essentially um, three poems in a one poem. It's one poem on this side, one poem on this side. And when you read the lines across, it's a third poem together. So that's what you will hear. And you'll hear a lot of repetition because of that. The first section in this poem is it sits above the contrapuntal. People close to you after uh, Herbert Woodward Martin, who is um, thought to be the creator of this particular form, and Christine Rain, who is a poet from Detroit, uh, who was the first person I actually heard write a contrapuntal. One, she asks if she can sit on the bench, and it is that kind of day in Santa Monica, slow and gentle, so that when she sits properly, like a teacher, or the pudgy mother of a girl named Marilyn. In unison, you raise your round faces. The wind hefts the voices of your deadlings. They are serious and sorrowful women, full of warnings. But today seem content to let you be, saying only, child, be thankful. Open your chest, that great cavern, to our other sister. And so you watch the sea. Who knows what the woman beside you hears? There are so many languages in the world, and your tongue is tied to this one. So you sip iced tea and lean a bit forward into them, your gone women, your sages who seem to be stroking your head. You begin to imagine the ocean floor as a cup, the pouty lips of God, the soft foam, the salt as if food, tasting sweet and clear. Two. When she turns to you, you think she might say something about the sea's beauty, about the sun's slow emergence, how salt tastes on the tongue. Instead, she says, I am hungry, tenderly, as if this is her name, 
the fact of it blooming in front of you, and she smiles. Sister, I would give you food, but I cannot. You, holding your empty hands, though you have just eaten. You have a wallet full of food, and she smiles again, and she begins to rise as if an apparition moves back into her crevice, her body no more than a crevice, an intersection for two opposing points. She nods and lingers a moment before turning her face to the sorrowful voices of your deadlings who moan, oh. Three. When she emerges from a corner at the drive through on a Detroit night, her eyes hollow, body stiff and dirty, she might screech, her need so black, so dark and dangerous, explain how she too emerges in tatters from a darker crevice, no more than a crevice, vile, angry. Sis, can you help? Get back, you say, fear seeding itself. She smirks, you think. It's hard to tell the dark takes even that of her triumphs. And again, you don't, and you mean emerge from the dark. Your hand grabs the box of chicken. No, you say, Jesus. And she smiles again. And she begins to retreat as if an apparition moves back into her crevice, her body no more than a crevice, an intersection for two opposing points. She nods and lingers a moment before turning her face to the voices of your deadlings who moan, oh, oh. Four, when she turns to you, when she emerges from a corner at the drive through on a Detroit night, her eyes hollow, body stiff and dirty, you think she might, she might screech, her need so black, say something so dark and dangerous about the sea's beauty, about the sun's slow emergence, explain how she too emerges in tatters from a darker crevice, no more than a crevice, how salt tastes on the tongue, vile, angry. Instead, she says, I am hungry, sis, can you help? Tenderly, as if this is her name, get back, you say, fear seeding itself the fact of it, becoming and blooming in front of you. And she smiles, she smirks. You think it's hard to tell. The dark takes even that of her triumphs. Sister, I would give you food, and again, you don't. But I cannot, holding up your empty hands, and you mean emerge from the dark. Though you have just eaten, your hand grabs the box of chicken. You have a wallet full of food. No, you say, Jesus. And she smiles again. And she begins to rise, retreat, as if an apparition moves back into her crevice, her body no more than a crevice, an intersection for two opposing points. She nods and lingers a moment before turning her face to the sorrowful voices of your deadlings who moan, oh, oh, oh. So it turns out I'm just full of all light and joyfulness today. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll go through one more of these and then we'll move into lighter terrain. How about that? Does that sound like a, like a good deal? All right. Okay, so this is, this is called Suicide Bridge. <laughs> um, sometimes what I believe isn't wise or even intelligible. It's a soft mule, an old sound, a language most abandoned to the nursery floor. Sometimes what I have to say is that I don't know what to say other than life is jacked up. Your divorce, your mother's death, our fury, the world and its raw hunger, that we leave a black tar trail of scars as we go, proof of our inhumanity and our cliches. I admit too that sometimes when it's too much, I walk slowly along suicide bridges, stone pavers, its short expanse bridging the long green gulf down to the black tangle beneath, just to see the chalk written words people have scribbled. Puppies, giggles, dolphins, babies, smiles, belief, hope, love, love, love. And sometimes at night, 
I watch documentaries in which dolphins squeal and leap and glide along boats, and I know when we are not looking, watch us with godlike curiosity. And other times, I stand by my apartment window, high above the bridge, and watch the lay guard woman with her dog, just a mutt she loves, walk back and forth, the beam of her flashlight wavering with each step. Watch her for hours, waiting for some soul to show up. I don't think anyone pays her to do this, though she is there beneath sun, moon, water, snow, rain. These two are our realities, unnamed humans imploring other humans, desperation and bleakness cajoled by hope and light, dolphins zipping and leaping into the air of our imagination. There really isn't much that makes sense in our world why we are made happy by another's body, why we are made sad. We move along, our complicated machines gaining commotion as we go, and on occasion we find ourselves faced with a body, a woman, say, who speaks an old language that you had nearly forgotten. And it is warm and golden and sounds like a whisper, feels like a grace, a hand on your arm. Mindfulness. Here we're back to Detroit. Um, I, I, I should just say, um, Detroiters, we, um, m most of us come up from Alabama at some point in our history, just straight up from the migration. N not a lot of creativity, although I find <laughs> that brown people tend to be very creative. Th that was not creative, just straight up to, the, to, the, to Ford or GM or whatever it was. Um, so we think of ourselves sometimes in Detroit as Little Alabama because the tie is so strong. And the linguistic tie and the language, the way we use language is also very strong. And so people, there are habits that get formed, right? uh, like so calling people, tall people stump, or uh, like calling people, like if they wear black shoes, you know, hey, black shoes. And that just becomes your name. So what you hear here in this poem is me titling folks based on their attributes, which is something that we would, some of us would do in Detroit. Not just Detroit, but you, you understand. Mindfulness. Bermuda shorts is at the bus stop in a shock yellow shirt, yellow cap, and matching yellow and black sneakers. Is looking not unlike a person dressed as a bumblebee. <laughs> and he is thirsty. Across the street is Starbucks, leaving him with options, the bus or thirst. But this is Detroit. City of bad attitude, drive slow as you want to be bus drivers. The bus will be late. So Bermuda runs through traffic, which isn't <laughs> traffic as it was, but as it is, which is pitiful and sparse and so no hard hassle, and buzzes into and up to the counter where he puts on a show, breathes so hard that Apostle Brown looks up from his paper and frowns at Bermuda's jive-acting bumblebee butt. Bermuda <laughs> gasps for water and is told, we don't give water, to which he rejoins, I can't get a glass of water? The bugs of his eyes bulging. Can't do it, annoyed barista says, mouth tight as a fist. To which Bermuda puffs, well, why not? Which is when manager barista, head bald and shiny as a mirror, eyes moving across the spine of her memories where they rest, on an unexpected indentation, a small, persistent curve of kindness says in her vermouthy way, well, we typically sell water. But, sighing and shaking her bald head, hold on, before moving to the faucet. That, sir, is when you should not have gotten brand new and yelled, hurry up! You'd have done better, Bermuda, to quietly watch the small back of her turn and be thankful for the moment of her familiarity and be thankful for the moment of her thankfulness. It's good to remember when someone is giving a thing they need not give, a glass of water, a smile, what love they can muster. We are wise to feel stroked by the warm genius of a world that does not motor on just reciprocity and sense, but on something altogether more mysterious and splendid.
enlightenment. She is merging onto the Etzel Ford Freeway in a car no longer made, in a city that no longer makes it, talking on her cellular phone, slouched to the left, fingernails purple and red and caging the wheel, head cocked and foot heavy. In pursuit of a race car, she's bought a roll of black duct tape, has rolled three racing stripes down the sedan's hood as if she's been whispering with Buddha and he said, sister, relinquish your resistance, your discomfort, forsake your ego, which is what she's done, which is what it means to want but not have in a city stacked with desire to know that desire is our most ruinous trait, the moment in the morning when you decide to be unsatisfied and unhappy. Our want is just one of many in a line of wants, and the line of wants is ancillary to the line of needs. People close to you are hungry, and you have ignored it. People close to you have lost their jobs. Today, somebody's mother has died. Today, somebody's child has been murdered. Today, Somebody has lost sight, and your Lumina runs. Your Lumina runs well. Luminosity woman, no one's coming to save you. There is nothing from which to be saved.